Welcome to this episode of the Business of Practice podcast, where we focus on the financial and human sides of equine veterinary medicine. In this episode, Amy Grice, VMD MBA, is going to talk to us about generational differences in veterinary practice. Dr. Grice was an equine practitioner for more than 20 years before starting veterinary business consulting. She advises veterinarians and practice owners on a wide variety of projects and challenges, and she is the current AAEP treasurer. The Business of Practice podcast is brought to you by Care Credit. The Care Credit Healthcare Credit Card helps improve the payment experience for your clients and your financial performance. Welcome, Dr. Grice. It's so nice to be here today. Thanks for asking me. Well, I really appreciate you talking to us about this and and offering some guidance on both directions, both with the younger generation and the older generations that are that are in equine veterinary practice and just veterinary practice today. But we know that we are having a shift in the generations in veterinary medicine. But what does that mean for the profession? Well, generational differences are, you know, there are different experiences that different um, people have as they are growing up and they really shape how they look at the world and how they communicate, how they, how they basically feel about how the world is. And so you think back to the baby boomers who, um, you know, are a cohort that was born between 1946 and 1964, give or take, because everybody, the years are always different. Um, You know, they were shaped by um, being a post-war generation. Um, There were, uh, their parents often had been through the depression. Um, There was some, uh, you know, fear about the Cold War. You know, they they had the kids in the classrooms hiding under the desks in case there was, you know, this is how generations are shaped. And then you think about, um, you know, 9-11, how that shaped a generation. You had kids um, coming home when women started really working, when so many percentage of women were in the workforce. You had what were called latchkey kids and um so every generation is so shaped by how their, um, you know, what was going on in the world and how their personal um, upbringing was. And so there are some broad generations that can be made um, between different uh, what people have, have sort of uh, separated into different types of generations like Generation X or Baby Boomers, Millennials, Generation Z. Um, and so. Those differences definitely cause differences in how people are able to communicate with each other and their perspectives on what other people feel. And one thing we have to remember is that every single generation has looked at the younger generation and thought the world was coming to an end. So when we think about the silent generation, which are those 1928 to 1945, the ones that were you know, in World War Two, and, um, you know, they were, they had a, had a tough go of it. And they looked at the baby boomers who, you know, a bunch of them were hippies, um, you know, free love and all that. And they thought the world is coming to the end, to an end. And the same thing, now the baby boomers are looking at the millennials or Generation Z, and they're thinking, oh, my God, everything is going yeah going away that we know. So there's always that fear of change. Yeah, that's true. And I, I think there's also, you know, as has been brought up several times that every generation thinks the next generation that's younger hasn't worked as hard, hasn't paid their dues. And the younger generation thinks the older generation are stuck in their ways and won't listen and aren't willing to change. So, I mean, that that seems typical of, of how the generations typically you know, look at each other. But let's let's look a little bit about what does the veterinary industry look like today? There was a good blog that was put out by the AVMA um, in 2021 about the general generational shift in the veterinary profession. And we've got four generations currently represented. There 
are less than 1% of the silence, which makes sense because they're really getting quite elderly. It's 0.4% of the veterinarians are in the silent generation. The baby boomers, which used to be like, you know, the the big majority, they're down to 29.9%. And it's the millennials now who, you know, are about 1981 to 1996 they're up to 35.1% of veterinarians in the workforce. And we've got uh, Generation X, which was a sort of a small uh, generation of 1965 to 1980. Um, They're 34.6. And so we've got mostly Xs and millennials, and then followed by baby boomers and a teeny tiny amount of silence And because the Gen Z is so new, we really don't have any veterinarians yet. They're just not old enough to be veterinarians yet, but they're coming. And they, um, from a, I'm I'm a tail end baby boomer. And and from my perspective, the Gen Z, they're kind of weird. (laughs) (laughs) Again, that goes back to how we all look at the next generation. A workplace. I mean, it's, uh-huh. it's interesting. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. Millennials that, that are now the biggest uh, part of the workforce, they are not the biggest number of practice owners, though. They're mostly associates at this point. Um, and so there's, there's that uh, friction sometimes that you would expect to have. Um, you know, baby boomers, are, are mostly practice owners. And, you know, the way that they were brought up, they're very used to and believe in hierarchy. They believe in respect and top-down management. And so they have these expectations and yet um, younger generations, in particular the millennials, like a more flat organizational chart where people um, there's just because of somebody's um, status that they aren't considered a um, have to have a higher um, value necessarily. And so they like a flat structure. They, they like um, the kind of leadership and uh, sort of workplace relationships that are not hierarchical they they don't like that top down autocratic thing at all and yet that comes very um naturally to baby boomers yeah um and so that's you can get some friction there um and and oftentimes that friction feels to baby boomers as though the millennials um are disrespectful or um communicate too casually um, when in fact they were brought up on, you know, the purple dinosaur, Barney, where they sang songs together and it was very collaborative, you know, Blue's Clues and Bob the Builder and we all do it together and we sing songs while we're doing it. And so wanting that sort of um, experience, that mentorship, that that uh, collaborative kind of way of doing things, that's what they were brought up on. And so they aren't very satisfied when there isn't collaboration. They're not very satisfied when it seems like there's this artificial hierarchy. So when you're looking at this in the industry, what does it really mean? I mean, what are millennials bringing to the table in veterinary medicine? You know, one of the things that um, that they're bringing is this digitally native uh, generation. So they I mean, for as long as they have been conscious, um, they've been using technology. And so um, they have so much to offer when it comes to implementing new applications, adopting technology that can basically make veterinary work easier, faster, more efficient. And so when practices can, you know, tap into that skill, um, they can really help their practices be more efficient. And that means listening to their ideas, adopting some of them and asking them 
like if you're an older person, asking them to teach you how to use this, some of these new things, rather than just saying, oh, no, that's not for me. You know, because it's hard learning something new. (laughs) But they kind of, when they teach you, they can make it so much easier. Um, And another thing, uh, because so much uh, growth in our client population are millennials, right? Um, when we think back to the the uh, situation, the a the American Horse Council survey, the American Horse Publication surveys, they show that a lot of our horse owners are shifting to the millennial demographic. And so, in order to understand those clients better, communicate with those clients better. Um, it's important that we listen to our millennial veterinarians because they're they understand their peer group. And yeah. so they understand what the needs and expectations of those clients are. And they are are such an important asset in strengthening relationships with them. Um, I remember feeling kind of. I don't know, sad or or um, I don't know, kind of. um just upset in a way when one of my clients who was not my generation um, decided she wanted to use one of our younger veterinarians in the practice because they were sort of socially at the same place. They talked about the same bands and they, and I thought, whoa, what, you know, why don't they love me anymore? And (laughs) It it really and I'd known her since she was a kid. And I think what was happening was she was an adult and she wanted a peer adult, you know, to uh interact with her as a as a client for her horse as an adult. And you know, it the so it it's really amazing, um baby boomers as they're getting older, to see the millennials just you know, really hitting it out of the park with these new clients. I mean, because they they think the same way. They want to work collaboratively. Um, one of the important things about millennials for baby boomer uh, owners to realize is that as a group, um, they prioritize well-being, healthy work-life balance. And so it's really important, especially in equine veterinary medicine right now, we're holding on to your your workforce is important um being supportive of having time to have life outside of practice um is is one of the things that will help them feel engaged and satisfied and another thing is engaging the entire team which i think i said a few minutes ago in decision making you know collaborative where their where their thoughts and their views um, have some meaning that they get to um, make a difference in how the practice is is um, functioning. They also care quite a bit about the impact um, they're having on the community. And so in talking about, you know, talking in team meetings, you know, understanding that they care about making the world a better place. That's one of the the things um, that all millennials, even outside of veterinary medicine, um, care quite a bit a- about. There have been worldwide surveys, um, you know, of tens of thousands of workers, and they say that they would take oftentimes a job in a in a place that was not their first choice or for, you know, maybe slightly less money if they thought they were making a difference in the world, a positive difference. And so they really do care about that stuff. The Business of Practice podcast is brought to you by Care Credit. Care Credit keeps equine veterinarians at the heart of care by providing horse owners with simple, budget-friendly financing options. By bridging the gap between cost and care, Care Credit supports healthy financial relationships between veterinarians and their clients. It can help them move forward with care a horse needs whenever and wherever it's needed. So how do we facilitate communication between these different generations being you and I are both, you know, late baby boomers. And I know that there's a lot of millennials, Gen Xers, you know, we've, we've raised children, which, you know, helps us maybe 
do the gap a little bit, but you can't treat these like children. You can't treat the next generation like children that they don't know anything and you have to raise them right. So how do we facilitate this communication? I think the first thing is just for for all generations to understand that these differences are differences that um, simply come from people's experiences and that we ha- all of us have different expectations and perceptions. Um, one of the ways to facilitate communication with somebody that you know is a different generation is to say something, this is how I see it. How do you see it? The other thing is just to understand that both need to move toward the other um, in terms of communication uh preferences. I remember an intern of mine that was looking for a job and was communicating with a possible employer. And she was getting frustrated because she kept sending him text messages and was not receiving replies. And he would leave her voicemails and ask her to call him. (laughs) And so they had differing uh, choices, channels that they preferred to communicate in. And so they weren't actually connecting at all. And so somebody has to take the step forward to say, you know, this this other person is obviously more comfortable with this other channel of communication. And so I'm going to use that. So taking a step toward the other and being understanding rather than um, frustrated or crabby or dismissive or judging. Um, Rather just saying, hey, this is how I see it. This is what I prefer. But this other person prefers something else. And I think we've all run into that in our in a in our careers. I know that there are Mm -hmm. some people that if you want to talk to them, I have one daughter that. She has a phone that she texts and calls on. And if I call her, she won't answer. If I text her, she'll respond. Uh That's inspiration. That's just who she is. Yeah. Whereas I have other friends that as soon as you call them, oh, man, they just pick the phone back up because that's our generation. We answer the phone. Right. So it's it's fun to kind of see how that that works with the communication. So what can you offer? Dr. Grice, that might help some of these, because like you said, a lot of practice owners are baby boomers. A lot of the up and coming associates and people who've been in the industry for a while, who the practice owners hope will want to come up and be partners or or owners at some point. How do you move them toward each other so that they can work more efficiently and communicate better? What, what are, give us some solid steps to take. I think the first is to do some reading so that you understand um, the different aspects of different generational experiences. Just to remind yourself that what you experienced growing up was not the same. The world changes. There are different traumatic experiences that we have globally. We have different um, sort of global political things that go on. Um, And so people are shaped by what's going on around them. And so doing some doing some research, basically. And there's plenty of it out there. And some there are some really interesting things to read. Um, And so I would encourage people um, to just do a little bit of and fortunately, at the last um, AAEP convention, there were a number of different opportunities. There were two very good speakers on generations. um, And you you could have access to those materials as AAEP members. They were both very interesting and and useful. Um, Another thing to think about is to, when you have a thought, particularly a negative thought about another generation, someone you're working with, use the rule of six, which is, Whatever thought you're thinking, think of five other possibilities that are also things that could be happening with that particular person's behavior or whatever it is that is making you have this sort of negative thought about them. What else could it be? If you think of five other things, it's amazing how you start to just get yourself out of that 
it, uh, it's kind of like a ditch that just sends you down that, oh my God, there they go again, right? Um, use that technique of the rule of six because it really helps you to broaden your mind and think about other possibilities. Also, keeping very open communication um, is important so that when I, I've just always found that when you keep on talking and you keep on telling people your perspective and saying, this is how I see it, but how do you see it? And that goes both ways, whether it's an owner to an associate or an associate to an owner. That's kind of a softening statement because you're asking for the other person's perspective, but you've had a chance to to put yours out there on the table, but not in a way that is um, overbearing or aggressive. It's just, you know, this is how I see it. How do you see it? Because the thing is, Nothing ruins a good story that you're telling yourself, like hearing the other side, right? And so it's important to just understand there's another side to the story. There always is. And is there anything else that you can recommend, Dr. Grice, from your experience or from your readings that might help these generations just, they they all want the same thing. They want to provide really good health care. They just have a little different way of seeing the world and approaching it. So how can we use all the great things from these different generations in a, in a more cohesive manner? It really comes down to good communication and understanding uh, other generations and being open to the fact that the way that you see the world is just your reality. It's your perspective. It's not the actual fact. And, you know, I, I just think people need to open their minds to the fact that how their perspective isn't reality. And so they need to be um, curious. They need to be exploring what other people, how other people see the world and how they are um, experiencing different situations. And so when you have a client that say is a baby boomer, and you are a millennial, when, you know, actually sort of saying to yourself, okay, this person, this person is going to more than likely value um, some respect. They're probably, because of their sense of hierarchy, they're going to call me doctor, whatever. And even though I'm younger than they are, and, and they're going to expect a certain type of communication. That is um, has a little bit less peer to peer, right? And so I just think thinking about it is probably the most important thing in recognizing that that expectations are different. That's a, a really good point. And you had mentioned before some of the things from the AP, and I will put in the article that goes with this podcast. I will put some of the articles that we had from this past AEP convention that talked about it. And I'll also um, put a couple of others that we've had on, on talking about generational communication in the article. So you can go back and I'll have links there. So you can just look at that, look for that on equimanagement.com. So for under the business of practice podcast with Dr. Grice. So is there anything else that you had wanted to mention today, Dr. Grice? I think um, just in closing, I'd like to say that um, millennials do seek uh, mentorship from the older generation. They they want to know about their ideas. They want to do a great job Um, and they they really want mentorship and they want their leaders to approve of them. And they often seem like they need a little bit more. I've heard the words like handholding, but it isn't that. It's that they really want to, they they recognize that the people that have come before them have a lot of experience and so much to teach. And they want to, to learn that because they want to be the best that they can. And so um, it's important that that mentorship be recognized, that they want that they want to accumulate knowledge from the people who have come before them. 
And, and that's a great closing comment, and I really appreciate it. And thank you, Dr. Grice, for joining us for this Business of Practice podcast. And a big thanks to our sponsor, Care Credit, for allowing us to talk about these important topics. And we invite you to visit equimanagement.com or your favorite podcast network to hear every episode of the Business of Practice. And if you have any questions or suggestions, you can send an email to me at kbrown, that's the letter K Brown, at equinenetwork.com. The Business of Practice podcast is a production of the Equine Podcast Network, an entity of the Equine Network, LLC. Mm-hmm.